production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. This time on Broad and High. Meet the maker behind the Tarte Peach, a local line of lipstick products. Well, I wanted them to contain ingredients that you can pronounce and understand. A Columbus artist responds to the current political atmosphere through his latest work. I started a racing congress. And explore a collection of penny scales that were once a fixture of the American landscape. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Quickle and welcome to Broad and High. So if you like lipstick like I do, tell me, when's the last time you looked at its list of ingredients? Probably never, and even if you did look, you might have had a hard time actually finding it on the label. And that is what led Clintonville resident Jordan Penix on a quest to learn what exactly she was putting on her lips. And in the end, she just started making her own. She's the woman behind the tart peach, and she gave us a peek inside her line of homemade cosmetics. We are in my basement in Clintonville. This is my lippy layer. Lippy layer. So I've always loved lipstick, and actually even from a young age, like I've only ever worn lipstick. I've just, it's the only cosmetic that I really wear besides um, mascara. Yeah, I started, started making lipstick because I was curious about the ingredients that were in lipstick and who makes it. Uh, so I researched a lot of lipsticks, you know, drugstore lipsticks, and I couldn't find the ingredients. Like even if you go online, on the tube you can't find it, online you can't find it. Um, so I started making lipstick based on that fact. Well, I wanted them to contain ingredients that you can pronounce and understand. So that was my main goal. So I made this handy li dandy little ingredient list card that is now going to be included with every purchase because I want to be transparent and I want to be like, this is actually what you're putting on your face. And the main ingredient is um, a castor seed oil, which is super great, super hydrating. People use it for hair growth. Like it's, it's interesting, but it's different uses, of course, all around. This is the Candelia wax from a desert plant native to, yeah, Northeast Mexico, which produces a scale. All these waxes are interesting, like coating materials that, you know, wick away water, waxes. Beeswax is also uh, an ingredient, and then uh, carnauba wax, which is also a wax. Um, and I'm proud to say there's no artificial fragrances. It's just a vanilla essential oil that I use. Um, it's diluted in jojoba oil, so yeah, and, and everything you could pronounce. So I actually started with one color, and that was the Rusty Maroon color. And then from there, people were like, that's kind of cool. So then I started making other colors that were like, oh, maybe, maybe I'll do some reds and do some pinks. And then I was like, oh, maybe I can do purples. So I have lots of colors. I have blue, purple, pink. Of course, your neutrals, like the Rusty Maroon. Um, I have softer pinks. So yeah, I have tons of different, I think there's only, there's over 30 lipsticks now that I have. And then now I've created like a little pack of lipsticks of the three most popular colors, which are these colors. And it's um, Poppy, Original Red, and Rusty Maroon. Those are the three most popular colors. I created like a lip balm, which is a peppermint lip balm. It's, you know, shea butter, coconut oil, um, and it's, it's like a paper, you know, guy, so he's recyclable, um, push up, kind of like a popsicle. I kind of wanted to make a step system, so I have the um, vanilla lip polish, which is like a sugar scrub. That guy, that's what you would do to like kind of get the dead skin off your lips, and he's tasty. And then you would use the lip balm after that, and then you would put the lipstick on. It's pretty cool to be an entrepreneur in Central Ohio because people super support you. I mean, there's so many businesses that Columbus people love. Like if it's from Columbus, they're gonna eat it, they're gonna smell it, they're gonna wear it. I don't know, I love Columbus in that sense that 
Columbus people love Columbus products. And I actually like that I'm so specialized just in lipstick. I think it's cool that I just do lipstick. I'm the lipstick gal, yeah. Visit thetartpeach.com to learn more about Jordan and her line of handmade lipsticks. Fake. It's a word that's been used a lot this past year, or at least as it relates to news and the socio-political atmosphere that we've been living in lately. But now it's the title of a new exhibit at Angela Maleka Gallery downtown. Columbus artist Tim Rietenbach shows us his latest body of work that was created in this unique moment in time. But it's not all about the politics. You know, one thing that um, I've grown to love about Tim is my trust in him and his work. And I just trusted that he's going to make what is meaningful to him. My ideas do come out of, um, I think they've always kind of come from a direction of uh, dissatisfaction. In the time period that this work was made, it was all very much pop culture and politics. Um, so I think the work is all a response to that generally. The show is called Fake. I think um, we've heard of the word fake a lot in the news the last year. And so again, um, Tim's conscious not to be too kitschy about what he's dealing with, but really um, there's kind of this underlying um, momentum of, you know, what's authentic, what's real, um, and what's kind of pushed on us as propaganda or fake or something false. And so each of the works in the show represent or somehow relate to, to that word. I, I went on vacation to Canada and the weather was horrible so we were up in a cabin for a week um, and I but I had my laptop with me and so I was trying to figure out something to do while we were sitting around in the cabin and I, I started a racing congress. I basically came to the conclusion that erasing them was the most gratifying um, thing to do and to kind of erase the, the person and just look at the trappings that they use as their profile image. And then so I had that made into a curtain. So one was the first round was kind of cathartic to just get rid of the people. Um, um, and, and then that was at a time that was before the tax bill kind of thing happened where they really were just known for not accomplishing anything. and. Both parties just kind of stalemating the other to keep from getting anything done. So the idea of them sort of disappearing was also kind of built into that, that gesture. Now they have that tax plan, which depending on your opinion, is either horrible or okay. So uh, it was another round of cathartic gesture to, uh, to de-thread it. Um, so all the uh, horizontal threads are removed, so the image is just what's left on the, the printing on the vertical uh, thread. But this work now is so beautiful and elegant, almost this lacy, um, such depth and layer, but it started with something that on his summer vacation on his laptop was kind of this joke and where am I going to go with it, but it becomes so sophisticated in the result that that's kind of the genius of Tim's work. I've made a lot of work directly after uh, Trump got elected and being sort of aghast at the, la the language that he gets away with and, and in a position of uh, prominence and power. I made a man's jacket out of translucent paper. Um, so in this case I had a, a typography book that I used um, random pieces of um, text to build an image of all of the horrible quotes that he sort of had archived at that point. I could actually make a whole line of these jackets at this point. <laughs> now they're just really, stu it's a stupid jacket. The show is very current. It, it very much deals with what we're all as Americans dealing with um, politically, socially. And I think artwork is one of the best mediums in which you can approach some of the things that, that are happening 
whether you agree or disagree who's in office or not. You know, I'm interested in artwork that can stand the test of time, that 30 years from now still has a relevance or, or really reflects the time with, with which it, when it was made. And that's very much Tim and his work. It, it stands the test of time. Fake is on view through February 24th. Visit AngelaMalekaGallery.com for details. And learn more about the artist by exploring his webpage at TimRietenbach.com. Back in the 1930s and 40s, penny scales were found on street corners all over the country. For a mere cent, you could learn how much you weigh. Now at the time, the only other way to do this was to visit your doctor's office. These centuries of the American landscape have long since faded from view, but not for one Columbus resident. Christopher Steele showed us his collection of penny scales that chronicle 100 years of American ingenuity and industrial design. Every time it rains, it rains, pennies from heaven. Well, I'm Christopher Steele, and I collect American penny scales and have been collecting them for 37 years. Call boxes, parking meters, municipal clocks, and penny scales were all considered uh, sidewalk architecture. The Hollywood movie star scale, uh, it would print the date and your weight on the back. The act of getting on this machine supplies the energy for this to work. They're, these are green machines. They didn't require electricity for the most part. Well, at first, it was the only way people could weigh unless they went to the doctor's office. So they had to be creative just to get people up on the scale. Colonial Fairway Golf Scale, you could, it's an arcade scale. You could drop in a coin, you'd swing at it with a small lever and try to win your money back. I like mechanical things as well as beautiful pieces of Americana. This is the premier exhibition that's never been done before in America. This is the first comprehensive celebration of the American penny scale. In their peak, they were bringing in over $100 million a year. That's 10 billion pennies going annually into the penny scale. The government relied on the penny scale to help keep pennies in circulation. The national, the oldest scale in the collection, was outdoors for 75 years when I bought it. And it still works today. It was operated by Chaz B. Tricky out of Cincinnati, Ohio. He operated the scales that were outside of the train station at the turn of the century as well. My, some of my favorite scales, like Mr. Peanut, are the novelty scales. There were only 65 of him made. Kids would break loose from their parent and they would immediately rub his nose for good luck. I'm just fascinated by signage and message. And they had to employ those because these were silent salesmen. A moon that was always new. You'll see in the beginning the scales are kind of Art Nouveau and uh, those are where they're pretty elegant, they're filigree. And then they go into the deco. Now the deco came when they opened up King Tut's tomb and you'll notice some of these look like sarcophagi or mummy cases when the modern skyscraper started popping up into the sky. The scales started looking like skyscrapers. The municipal clock was probably the biggest influence on the scale design, and so was the grandfather clock. Well, the, some companies tried to pretend they had no springs, and some really didn't have springs, but springs would get tired, and in the upper and lower ranges might not be as accurate. So levers would maintain their accuracy, and so they would advertise no springs. Uh, well, I'm an advocate for the return of the public way, and I, I actually hope this uh, premiere will spark a, a, a renaissance of the public way. The, probably the heaviest one I have is about 300 pounds, 
and the lightest one's probably around 60 pounds, but they average in the 200 pound range. I always fantasize about stamp collecting, but because I can put it in my pocket and get on a plane. 18 pennies to get your full reading on this one. Learn more about this history of the American penny scale and see more photos from Christopher Steele's collection by visiting theamericanway.com. For more than 30 years, Vazi Douglas has been creating one-of-a-kind fashions in Columbus. Her free-flowing style is reflected in the clothing and accessories she showcases during her annual runway show at the King Arts Complex. Even when I was a child, before I went to school, I would draw fashion and I wanted to be a fashion designer. I didn't think I'd have to sew, I thought I would just create these outfits and somebody would sew them because I'd be so fabulous. Um, I didn't start sewing until I was 25, so that's one thing. So um, when I first started sewing, the drawings that I was doing were looking like Vogue patterns. So of course I'm buying Vogue patterns and they're kind of hard to do because you got to buy the pattern, then you got to cut out the pattern, then you got to pin it to the fabric, you got to cut that out, then you got to follow. Oh, that makes my head hurt. It evolved over years. I didn't do right, great right off, that's for sure. But. What inspires me is fabric and color and texture. And I just get oh, excited about all that. That's exciting to me. I do hats, jewelry, jackets. One of my favorite things to do are jackets. I do jackets out of upholstery fabric. And I think that's what I'm best known for. When you think about it, it's really high quality, it's uh, good textures. Uh, sometimes you can use front and back. I love upholstery. Now the show that I'm doing next month is uh, once a year since 1982, I do a fashion show where I preview my new collection. And so this is the 34th year of doing that. And I will be sewing and making jewelry and purses and hats up until they take the sewing machine and say, okay, the models are here to try their clothes on. I have two lines. I have Vossi designs, which is like, uh, maybe like what I have one kind of maybe everyday wear type of things more. And then I have the Owl Voice Collection, which is my higher end collection. This show is gonna be a whole show of the Owl Voice Collection. That's something I've never done before, so. It's exciting and scary. But it'll be probably a hundred and something pieces. Yeah, cause I have, I have like uh, 18 models. I like colors and I like putting things together that are unusual. I think a lot of people, if they lose a little weight or gain a little weight, they can still fit my outfits. And, and they're changeable because you can wear them frontwards, backwards, sometimes upside down because they're not structured. I like outfits and when you walk in a room, you might love them, you might not love them, but you're gonna notice them because they're gonna be different. I love people, I love fashion, I like color. And I just want to leave something, a legacy when I leave, that uh, people love my clothes, they're easy to wear. I want to also be a nice and a spiritual person. Our final artist today draws inspiration from the scraps of our lives that are hidden away in drawers or tucked deep into shelves. These neglected bits of ephemera take on new life in his three-dimensional watercolor paintings. They might force you to question what is real and what is imagined. Here's more about Dayton artist John Emery.
You know, you only get to be an artist when you're like Michelangelo. Or there are artists. I'm, I'm just a painter. Working toward maybe being an artist. But, yeah, I'm just a painter. I just like old stuff. I'm quite comfortable with it that, yes, I'm nostalgic, and yes, I am romantic, and I think people who like my work are generally that way also. I remember when computers first came in, I went to a lecture where they talked about, you better get on the, the computer super highway. If you don't, you're going to be left on the back roads. And at that time, I sort of realized the back roads are interesting. The super highway is not. So I stayed on the back roads, I guess. In a lot of my earlier paintings, I would do the painting of an object and then sometimes actually take the real object and somehow glue it onto the paper itself. But as it progressed, the objects were never exactly the right color or exactly the right size or proportion. I started making the objects out of paper. The idea of taking a three-dimensional object and painting it to look like a two-dimensional object and a two-dimensional object painted to look like a three-dimensional object. There's something about physically moving things around on a page which you really don't have that opportunity to do in watercolor. You can do sketches ahead of time or think about where something will go, but once you've painted the rock, it's gonna stay there. But if I have a paper rock, then I can shift it around and say, oh, I like this place better, or I don't like a rock at all. I can't paint from my imagination very well. I just actually have to see the object. If I don't have the object, I'll do research to find the object. I tend to paint, I think what would be described as wet on wet. I just start painting and let things happen, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad. In watercolor, you only get one chance to get it right. I like the danger in that. That's sort of the fun way of doing it. I tend to use big brushes. Because I'm using very stiff paper, I start out by taking the whole paper and soaking it for half hour, and then I staple it down to a big board so it'll stay flat. I've got probably too many tubes of paint, but people look at it and they say, do you ever paint with anything but brown? And occasionally, yeah, I, <laughs> I guess I do. Almost everything I see is sort of brown or gets back to, if it's old, it's brown. In 2000, we had the opportunity to buy an old schoolhouse in New Zealand and have renovated it. And that really started the going back every year for four months. And I paint there. Dayton is also just a easy, very easy town to live in, access to all kinds of stuff. Everybody's just sort of very open and there's a lot of stimulation here. It's a real contrast between where we live in New Zealand, the color is almost always yellow ochre and here it's green. So, and I also avoid the winter in both places. I'm really keen on collecting art and having a lot of art around. And somebody asked me one time what my definition of art was, and I said, well, it's what people don't throw away. And so in 500 years, you sort of hope that somebody will find something and say, I've always had this, and I 
don't know anything about it. Let's take it to Antiques Roadshow. I don't know. <laughs> it feels good to have people like your work now and look at it and really have meaning to them and hang it on their wall. But the real goal here is to have somebody have it in 500 years. That's what it's all about. I'm making the stuff that I hope gets stuffed into the trunk and rediscovered by somebody else. That's it for this week's episode of Broad and High. Remember, you can always find all of our stories online at WOSU.org and on the WOSU Public Media mobile app. Be sure to give us a follow on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're closing out today's show with the jazzy lounge music of Change It Up Charlie. This Columbus band released their first album in 2015, and word is, they're working on a new one this year. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching. We'll see you back here next week. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. And PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you.